All right, uh, so my talk's going to be oriented around uh, data flow, and um, it's not actually entirely in production yet. It's something that we're currently working on. We've started swapping out some of our services to incorporate this, and the plan is that uh, hopefully by the end of the year, we would have completely migrated uh, to this new way of, of uh, developing our services. Um, so before I go on, uh, my name's Courtney, as uh, Alice pointed out earlier, a founder of Block.Tech and software engineer currently attached to Haskell, Scala, C++, and Java. So the languages that I currently use more or less regularly. Um, our focus tonight is going to be on essentially that, but we'll come on to what that actually means in a minute for those who don't immediately know what it is. Um, the company that I work for uh, is called uh, 42 Data. And uh, our main focus at the moment, um, or actually our, our, the biggest part of what we do at the moment, is in anti-money laundering. We have a rules processing platform with um, the AML solution built on top of that. So we, we don't just do AML. Um, like I said, there is a platform and then there's a solution on top. The platform itself is very generic. And because of that, and the kind of clients that we have, we end up having a very uh, varied uh, use case for our platform. So we have customers from that have use cases varying from the kind of IoT type uh, situations to AML, like I mentioned. And the other thing that comes with that is that the deployment scenarios vary just as widely. So you end up in situations where you're in a vault somewhere where you don't have anything other than a laptop and everything needs to work on this one machine. From that up to a situation where a, a big a bigger client goes, right, we've got several billion records and we have this cluster. We want you to process all of this and get our results back for us. So the situations in which we need to deploy uh, our solution is very varied. And um, the challenge that we kind of had uh, building up to this has been to try and adapt to all the situations that we end up having to deploy uh, our platform in without, I guess, uh, code changes. And that's really uh, one of the motiv motivating factors behind uh, how we came to this. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, fast requirements, it got to a point where uh, the clients that we were getting, the situations were so different, it was really hard to always uh, add a new piece of thing that just did that extra bit for this client. And it got to a point where we had more requirements than we could actually code to keep up with. So we took a step back, looked at what we had, and kind of decided that um, architecturally, we had changes that we needed to make if we were going to actually continue and make the platform grow. Um, we evaluated other architectures and other structures, methodologies, and, and different ways of doing uh, the things that we, we were doing at the time. And we kind of went through most of them and said, well, we're not that far off what uh, they kind of suggest doing. So if you take the Lambda architecture or Kappa, for example, what we actually have at the moment is not that far off that. We, the, the thing that we found that came probably the closest to something that we thought was uh, really good for what we were doing was uh, Spring Cloud data flow. Um, but we are very uh, heavily invested in the Play ecosystem. So uh, adapting that would have practically meant rewriting most of the platform, if not all of it. Um, uh, so that's essentially what the talk is about tonight and the kind of solution that we came up with uh, for that. So. There is um, a, a kind of element to this of we, when we started reevaluating what we were doing, we realized that actually our, pro our biggest problem was that when we got a new client, it wasn't very easy to just take, take out the pieces that they didn't want and drop something else in. And one of the uh, big things about the, the new way we're trying to do it is to make it very composable. And in theory, it's not that new. We've had things like monads for a long time. Lots of research have gone into that. And monads are kind of the mother of composition, if you will, in software. Now, trying to do that at the software level, that's also not very new. You could, in theory, uh, compose microservices. And that's one of the kind of things people uh, went to service-oriented architectures for. But the, the, the main thing, I guess, was identifying the, I guess, general um, uh, 
uh, the general patterns that we were using and trying to abstract away from the detail so that we could easily adapt to new situations certainly a lot quicker than we were before. Now, the old architecture that we have, as I mentioned, if you're familiar with the Lambda architecture, at the end of this, you should draw some kind of similarity to that. Now, at the far left, you've got, uh, we've got an ingestion pipeline, and the far right, we have the UI where the user goes in and they trigger some action to do some ingestion of the data from some data source. Now, um, we do some pre-processing, other things on the data, and that goes into a buffer. Currently, we're very oriented around Kafka. Um, and we then have effectively your kind of batch layer and then your uh, streaming layer, which if you're familiar with the Lambda ar architecture is more or less there. And then we have our view layer. And for the moment, it's Elasticsearch. So the UI doesn't actually go to Cassandra and uh, Spark to fetch data directly. It just gets the cache results out of Elasticsearch. And that's more or less what, what we have. Um, at some point, I guess the, the slight variation on the typical uh, Lambda architecture is we occasionally have to go in and regenerate aggregation. So we kind of go through half of that process again. But um, it's, 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 it, it wasn't very suitable for what we were trying to do. Um, certainly not in the last, I guess, 12 or so months that we've been trying to uh, scale out. Now, it works in many cases, and it's worked for us for a relatively long time. And we kind of got to the point where we felt as if we were at the mercy of the frameworks that we were doing, uh, using. Uh, mostly, uh, that's Spark, because a lot of the uh, real work, if you will, gets done in Spark in the uh, current or old stack. Um, it's very difficult, or at least we found it very difficult, to guarantee the performance and stability of the platform by, uh, with all the things that we'd kind of intermingled to get what we wanted out of it. And it became increasingly fragile as we had more clients, more use cases, adapting it and having all those pieces continue to work reliably, it became increasingly fragile. So the kind of things that we identified as things that we wanted, um, ideally, uh, kind of fell under two main categories, predictability and flexibility. And on the predictability, the things that we wanted to always kind of be able to uh, predict was the performance, stability, and the scale of the system. As I mentioned, you could be in a vault somewhere in a bank where you just got a laptop. You need to run the entire platform on a laptop. Or a week later, you could be you know, running against AWS, against a hundred servers so it varied quite widely now we when we started redesigning this we I, we looked around at the uh, existing kind of big data frameworks that you find Hadoop Spark Storm etc and there are common principles that they all identify as being important and essentially they can be uh, grouped on the idempotence commutativity and associativity it's really difficult to achieve all three and still get the kind of scale that we need to achieve. Um, probably the thing, and it's relatively newish research, the thing that comes the closest to achieving all three and still scale are CRDTs. Uh, if you're not familiar, that's uh, conflict-free replicated data types. Um, but that's not something that's very applicable or it would take a lot of work, I should say, to actually rebuild the platform to uh, be CRDT-like or provide CRDT functionality. Um, now, the diagram I mentioned earlier, or I showed earlier, the main point of it was to show the composition part of what I'm trying to talk about tonight. Um, we've managed to kind of agree that we can get a very long way by simply being idempotent and achieving immutability everywhere and anywhere that we can. We can go a long way with just those two. Um, and the kind of work that we've done over the last couple of months has reflected that. Now, as we worked on this, we came up with kind of a few abstractions or uh, I guess the, the things that makes it easier for us to be able to do what we, we've set out to. The first thing in there is a resource provider. So you could be running it locally on a Mac, or you could want to run it in uh, Mesos on Kubernetes or AWS. So we uh, essentially need to be able to plug in a different provider for where we're going to get some CPU from to run this thing on. 
The other thing is an orchestrator, and I'll come on to why that's important in a bit, um, but effectively an orchestrator, it, it's, it does what it says on the tin, right? It, it manages what's running, it kind of uh, monitors and says, okay, this thing is kind of going pear-shaped, we need to do something about it. That's more or less what the orchestrator uh, does. Now, the other thing in here is an event source. And if you're familiar with uh, things like CQRS, um, that's kind of where the event source idea came from. So when we looked at uh, all these different architectures, we kind of went around and looked at all of them and went, right, that looks good, that can do that kind of thing. And we took, I think, what we thought were the best of all of them and brought them into this. Uh, and an event source is one of those from CQRS, or rather event sourcing. Um, the other, or the two abstractions that we brought in that weren't really specific to any of these other architectures were we started making a distinction between services and executors because we have clients where we can say, for example, uh, be given a budget of, you know, they want to get the work done, but they don't want to spend a fortune uh, doing it. So we needed to be able to say, you know, if this thing isn't actually doing that much work, we don't need 10 instances of them. So shut them down or only run one of them. And uh, I'll come on to why that's important in a bit. Now, the relationship between services and executors is that a service essentially provides a very thin HTTP layer where you just make a request to it and it generates some event. That's all it does. It can do some validation and so on, but it's not meant to actually do any of the real work that that thing would usually represent in, for example, a service-oriented architecture. The executor is the thing that does the work. And in the uh, next few slides, it should become clear as to exactly what role each of these play. An orchestrator, as you can imagine, uses the resource provider to get some CPU to run some stuff on. Um, and I mentioned earlier that it also configures and monitors services and executors. All of these uh, generate events, and currently it's a mixture of Kafka for sticking the events in and using Zookeeper uh, to uh, basically uh, create a latch. So uh, leader election, basically, to say the, only this instance is going to work on or do anything with this event. Now, we. The thing I mentioned earlier about coming on to, uh, or one of the things I mentioned, was if we're given a budget to say, only spend 500 per month to do this thing, um, we need to be able to reliably do that, um, because if we go over, we're going to have to be the one that essentially foots the bill, right? And we've kind of taken a SLA approach, and what you get is, or what we've got, is um, effectively a way of creating executable SLAs. So for the moment, it's all handwritten. Uh, it's just a config, you generate some JSON that says this service needs to be able to uh, provide this level SLA. And um, we've separated these out. So all the things I mentioned earlier, uh, the abstractions, they all have their own interfaces defined and we have multiple implementations of them. We're, uh, we're making use of uh, Java's service loader. So depending on what's on the class path, it will use different things. Um, and an executable SLA just means that we can, for example, if we have a customer that is more interested in getting things done as fast as possible, we can just have uh, an SLA that says match upstream, which would just basically look at the rate of what upstream is producing and then match that. Whether that means spinning up new instances or doing something else, it wouldn't really matter because the, the kind of monetary part isn't really the big thing. And we have uh, currently only two implementations of SLAs, but uh, the idea was that you could drop in any other uh, implementation, implementation that you want. I mentioned earlier that actually most of these ideas aren't brand new in any way. We've kind of just been adapting and taking uh, things out of uh, different architectures that are relatively well known and kind of popular. Now, one other important thing in all of this is uh, metrics. Now, we, we have the orchestrator, which uh, let's go back a second. Um, the, the orchestrator uh, decides what to do depending on how each individual service in the pipeline is performing. And what it actually does completely depends on the implementation that's on the class path at the time. Um, but I'll, I'll go through the next diagram that I 
prematurely went through just then and it will make more sense after I explain that. So the new architecture is kind of uh, like this where we've got a separation as I said between services and executors now. You kind of always need your services on because that's the thing that uh, accepts requests from users or uh, from any, any other source that they might come from. So we have our service always on. The kind of flow is similar to the old one where the UI just makes a request to this service to say, all right, start an ingestion from this data source. It might be a URL, a file, or a database, or whatever. Um, what would then happen is um, it would, instead of start doing the work, it would actually generate an event. Um, and in the middle of all this is where the event sourcing plus the locking comes into play. And as I mentioned earlier, we're using Kafka at the moment for pushing our events into, and uh, the locking is done by uh, Zookeeper. The orchestrator sits in the middle of all of that. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that your service it's really only for validating stuff, so very lightweight work. Shouldn't actually really do anything that will take a lot of time. Um, the orchestrator and actually everything in there uses the event source, so Kafka in this case. Um, I've skipped most of that because the diagram would get very messy if I included all the lines. So uh, just imagine that every uh, uh, box that I put on there actually produces events as well. Now. The flow changes slightly. Um, at the moment, because we've not completely replaced the entire pipeline yet, actually the only thing we really needed um, was one Kafka buffer at the start, after we start generating uh, or, or ingesting data rather. Um, this is true, and I, I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but, and this is where Akka Streams comes into play. We adopted a reactive model because actually guaranteeing the SLAs, we needed greater control over when we actually took data because you don't want, for example, if we started uh, subscribing to a WebSocket stream to get the data, that upstream would just overwhelm downstream and then you end up in a situation where you've blown the budget, for example. So we needed control over when we said, right, let's get the next one. And that's one of the uh, good things that Acker Streams actually brings to the, the new setup. Now, we have one buffer at the moment upstream, that's just Kafka. We push into that from the ingest executor uh, or executor. Um, and I, I'll, I'll keep reiterating this, but there is a clear distinction between the ingest service and the ingest executor. A service literally only just generates, it does some validation and generates an event. And the executor is the thing that actually goes off and does any real work. Um, the rest of the diagram, you'll start to notice that instead of pushing, because obviously from uh, the ingest executor, Kafka won't automatically pull your data. You have to push that into Kafka. But everything else downstream actually pulls when they're ready and only when they're capable of handling the next piece of data. Um, the rest of the platform, we haven't completely migrated, but leading up to uh, Elasticsearch and Cassandra, we've written uh, some Acker Streams uh, flows for them. And what actually happens is that as you uh, go downstream, unless, for example, the uh, Cassandra uh, executor pulls data, nothing happens upstream. So the data just stays in Kafka. So it start, you have to start pulling downstream for anything upstream to happen beyond that buffer. And that's, why, that's mainly why the buffer is in place. Um, the rest of the flow is similar to the old architecture. Now, that might look worse because you suddenly have like these 10 other things going on. It looks more complicated, right? But you can literally write an executor that is no more than a function because all it needs to do is inspect some data, maybe do something with it, you know, change something, add something into it, and that's your executor. They, they are very small, and that's kind of the main idea. They're meant to be composable. You're meant to be able to say, oh, actually, this client doesn't want that. Let's just quickly write a function or something to replace that, drop that in, and suddenly, that's all you need. You don't need to go off and you know, create a new service, which might take a week or something, and, well, depending on what your life cycle is. Um, but it gets a lot easier to plug things in because they're a lot smaller. It's also a lot easier to test them as well. Um, now, 
it does look very panicky when you look at the diagram and try to understand or keep track of you know what's happening where events are coming from but actually you don't handle most of those events when you write an executor your function um, so the api that you get is just you provide a function that gets called when something happens and you decide when to pull the next thing in and that's it everything else gets handled by the libraries that we've written around it and the control uh, the uh, orchestrator i should say handles all the eventing and scheduling you generate configurations to say this service has this SLA. Currently, I mentioned we've only got two. Um, but you start to get the ability to be able to, using JSON, which isn't great for composability, but uh, using JSON at the moment, you could literally just go, all right, this service connects to this service, and that's all there is. If a customer comes along and doesn't like that or doesn't need that functionality, you just change the configuration, and that's it. It's a much easier conversation to have when you're in a meeting and you just say, well, okay, we don't currently do that, but give me a minute, and you change it on the fly, and that's it. Whereas before we would have to say, okay, that might be a week, two weeks, a few more weeks or whatever. It's a much easier conversation to have. Um, I included this uh, to try and give you an idea of kind of how it all strings together, but it started to get very messy, so I stopped. <laughs> um, now, this, this mostly just covers what I explained before, but actually, if you look uh, at down here. The important part is this very last event here. So the, the idea was that you were going to, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Twitter garden hose, they provide a sample of tweets that are going through Twitter. And the idea was that I was going to walk you through uh, building what essentially an entire pipeline to process that. Um, now, at the very end, you've got this domain exec, but this would essentially be something that you've written. Now, the important part is this pull n. And this is where the very last service downstream basically says, I need this data or I'm ready to accept more. And it starts pulling. And unless that happens, um, most of these other pulls, uh, not most, all of these other pulls, none of them actually happen until that very last thing downstream says, okay, I'm ready, give me the next one. The important thing that the uh, orchestrator does that I might have missed from the last slide or two slides, well, several slides ago. Um, the important thing that the orchestrator does is it will look at what uh, or how services are performing. So it will look at an, an executor and depending on the SLA that it's, that's been configured for that service, if, uh, for example, it's got the match upstream and your current executor is doing, I don't know, half the rate of what its upstream is doing, it will say, fine, go to the resource provider. Can you provision another one? Yeah, okay, let's provision another one. And it will leave that watch the uh, metrics and until it meets the SLA, it will try to uh, essentially spin up more instances. And once the load goes back down again, it automatically scales it back down. So you end up in a situation where you define your scalability by just configuring the platform to grow how you want it to, um, which essentially, well, I say essentially, but that makes it a very powerful thing because now we don't need to write code to be able to guarantee or, or provide all of these guarantees. And that's one of the things that was really important to us. Um, I was planning to animate this slide, but actually we went to the pub and I didn't bother. <laughs> Um, that's more or less. That's more or less it. Uh, I wanted to provide uh, or do some code examples as well, but it was really hard to try and cram all of this stuff in and still try and like get it within 15, 20 minutes and leave time for questions at the end. But if we, if I didn't, well, I haven't been booed off stage yet. So I'm assuming I could come back another time and maybe do a, a more practical walkthrough and show you guys like some of the interfaces and how it all works and probably do uh, the, the Twitter streaming example as a real thing. But um, yeah, and that's it. <laughs>